and welcome everyone. Uh, before we get started, I'd like to thank our guest panelist, Mike McNeil, for joining us today. Mike is with RPM Industrial Rubber Parts, our Parker Lord channel partner in Canada and New York State. Uh, our channel partners are critical to extending our reach to OEMs of all sizes in North America. And with that, let's start by going over what we will cover in today's webinar. Uh, first, we'll look at the introduction to vibration isolation theory. Uh, next will be considerations when selecting an isolator, degrees of freedom for the system, primary engine disturbances to isolate, common problems, mounting strategies and analysis methodology, Parker Lord capabilities, and how to get started. And also remember, we are live tweeting today's webinar, so join the conversation with hashtag vibration isolation. And now I will turn it over to Mitch, our technical support representative, and he will go over the vibration isolation theory. Uh, let's jump right in and we'll start with our vibration isolation theory. At the basis of every vibration system, we have three main components. It's going to be some mass, which could be a cab, a computer system, or in this case, we're going to be focusing mainly on an engine system. There's going to be a spring, and there's going to be a damper. And we'll drill down into that spring and the damper portion on these next few slides. If you think of a typical spring, a steel spring, you can pull a spring and it deflects some amount if you apply a certain force to it. And that's spring is going to be fairly linear. Apply more force, it stretches more. Elastomeric spring is going to be similar. It's going to have some elastic portion to it where you can apply a force and it deflects. One thing with an elastic is a little bit different. It's going to also have a nonlinear portion to it. You can apply an excess force and eventually that spring rate is going to become nonlinear. So when we design a system, we typically like to operate within that linear range of the elastomer so the results are more predictable. And as we get more details of an application, we can kind of design the mounts around that. The next item we look at is damping. So damping is the ability, or I guess the property of the system to absorb energy. If you think of a typical shock absorber on a car, it's kind of a basic damper. You hit a pothole and rather than the car bouncing down the road for several seconds, that damper absorbs a lot of that energy. So you don't feel the input for quite as long. For elastomers in our mounts, the damping is part of the elastomer. So every time you deflect that mount, some of that energy is going to be absorbed in the form of heat. It's called hysteresis damping. And the goal of that damping is to simply absorb some energy so the output is not as great to whatever you're trying to isolate, in this case, an engine system. If we look at this curve here on the right, so you can see the curve. The peak there, that's our resonant frequency. And what damping does, as you increase damping, that peak is going to be rounded off and the output to the system is going to decrease. So when we're sizing mounts for a system, we want to pay attention to where this peak is and if we can use damping to help bring down that peak so the outputs into the system are not quite as large. When we have a system, think of a simple spring mass, you apply a force to the spring it's going to oscillate up and down, and it's going to oscillate pretty consistently. That rate at which it oscillate, oscillates is the natural frequency. We have the two formulas for natural frequency here. Um, on the left, we have the metric formula, which is 1 over 2 pi times the square root of stiffness over mass. And in English units, it is 3.13 times the square root of stiffness over weight. And we use this natural frequency to determine what mounts we should pick to get the best transmissibility for our system. So transmissibility is a ratio of output over input. In any vibration isolation system, we want the output to be as low as possible. That gives us the greatest amount of isolation. And looking at this curve here on the right, you can see that we can shift that curve to the right, but the peak is pretty much always going to be about the same magnitude. So we have a natural frequency, let's say about 10 hertz, and you can see that peak is all the way up above 10. So that means that at that peak, we're amplifying our input by about 10 times. 
you know, we can change the mounts, move the curve a little bit left or right, but that peak is always going to be there. So we want to size the mounts so that that peak is outside of our operating range. We want to be on the tail end of that curve where we have the highest amount of isolation. Here we also have a video done by one of our aerospace engineers. He's going to kind of summarize that transmissibility curve I just talked about. And we have a good example to show you the three parts of a transmissibility curve. Part where we have an input and output, and they're very similar, transmissibility about one. We go through our natural frequency and resonance where we're amplifying, and then into the region of isolation. On the left-hand side, we have a transmissibility curve. On the x-axis, we have frequency, on the y-axis, we have transmissibility, which again is output divided by input. We're going to represent that curve using my hand in this mass. My hand is going to represent the input, the mass is going to be the output, and the rubber band is going to represent an isolator. Starting from the left-hand side at very low frequencies, as they create an input, we see that it's approximately the same as the output. When we divide the output by input transmissibility, we get approximately 1. As we move right on the curve and increase in frequency, what we see is very small inputs produce very large outputs. When we divide the output by the input, we get a number greater than one, which is the natural frequency or resonance of the system. When we continue moving right, increasing frequency, what we see is we can have very large inputs that produce very small outputs. This is what we call isolation, and this is the value that isolators provide to a system. So as we mentioned, you know, we have the three basic parts of a system, a mass, a spring, and a damper. And for our elastomers and our mounts, the spring and damper are often contained in the same elastomeric mount. There are still two types of systems that we can analyze. Uh, the first being a mass excited system. So if we think of our engine, that engine's the mass, it's producing some vibration, and we're trying to isolate it from the frame of a vehicle. So that would be a mass excited system. The vibration mounts are protecting the frame and the rest of the vehicle from the vibrations of the engine. If we look at a base excited system, you think of a cab in the same vehicle, you're trying to isolate all the inputs, whether it be from the engine, from road inputs, terrain inputs. We're trying to isolate all of those variables from getting into the cab. So that would be a base excited system where the base is causing the disturbances. So if we think back to that transmissibility curve, and we talked about that you can shift the curve left or right by increasing the stiffness of a mount or move it to the left by choosing a softer mount, we often get the questions, well, why don't we just pick the softest mount out there and move the curve all the way to the left so we have the highest region of isolation? And the answer is, well, not quite that simple. Um, every time you decrease your spring rate, you're definitely increasing your isolation but that allows more movement. So when customers call in or they come to us for a mount selection, you know, they often tell us, you know, we need to be able to isolate an engine at 1,000 RPM idle speed, 2,000 RPM operating speed, and we only have a half inch of sway space. So we, we try to pick a mount that's going to not only provide them isolation, but also be within that sway space they have to work with. You know, a soft mount may provide you great isolation, but it might require several inches or an inch to move to be able to handle your loads. So it's often a balancing act between the two. How, how much we need to have motion control. We do not want to exceed the sway space. And at the same time, we want to give you the best vibration isolation we can. For the engine, we want to make sure we're isolating your idle speed and all the way through your operating range. We're going to have our first poll question of the presentation. In general, at what point in your equipment design process do you select the engine mount? And your answer can range from very early on all the way up through very late. And there are five options there you can choose from. And after this poll question, Mike McNeil will take over and talk about the engine vibration modes we look at um, for typical engine configurations. Thanks, Mitch. So now let's take a look at some of the most common uh, vibration modes and get an understanding of the um, allowable pass um, that an engine can take. So here we see a typical uh, engine package. And as you can see from this, this, this picture, um, on the front, there's the typical uh, front engine mount. This could be a single piece isolator, it could be a two piece isolator. And on the rear section of the mount, we, we have another configuration of a, of a mount. Again, these could be single or these could be dual. 
Um, just below that, you'll see some of our uh, most popular and common solutions. Um, we can determine which one is best for you based on the type of application it is. Like, is this engine in a stationary uh, in-plant or is this a off on-highway or off-highway vehicle where we'd have to look at different, uh, different styles of mount? Well, we can determine that as we go through your engine profile. The main things that we want to understand is what are the motion paths of, of an engine set? And we can break this down into uh, two distinct categories. If you look at items one to three, which is lateral, four aft, and vertical, you can think of these as translations along each one of the axes of the X, Y, and Z axis. And conversely, uh, we also look at items uh, four to six, which is roll, pitch, and yaw, and those would be rotations about each one of those axes. These become important to understand as we look at how the motion of the engine can go and what are the disturbances that are being fired by the engine and how that's going to react. So we'll start off with, with the lateral motion. And in this particular case, we are looking at the translation or the side-to-side -side movement along the y-axis. And you can see how this has an influence on how the mount is going to deflect. Similarly, we look at the translation along the x-axis. In this case, this is the fore and aft, so you see the motion forward and back. And also, the, the third translation mode here is the vertical disturbance or the path, which is this, the up and down motion. So we look at these as the translation mode. So again, this is the motion of the, the engine along the axis, side to side, front to back, top to bottom. So a little bit different than the, the, the translation modes is we look at the rotation about each one of these axes. So in this illustration, we show that the motion of the roll or the rotation about the x-axis. Next up, we have the rotation about the y-axis. So this is the uh, pitch, the pitch forward and back. And then lastly, the third rotation is about the z-axis or the yaw. So this is rotation about the, the vertical axis. And you can see the effect that this has on each mount configuration. This becomes important as we look at the primary disturbances in it. Again, this is just a summary, uh, roll, pitch and yaw, rotation about each axis. So now that we have an understanding of what the allowable motion is, we start to look at what is the primary disturbance from the engine package itself on, a, on some of these systems and the motions that are, we're going to look at. We'll start off with just looking at three of the most common uh, engine packages that we isolate. The first one being the three-cylinder engine. These tend to be the most challenging to isolate just due to the complexity of the low frequency and multiple directions of excitations. So you can see in this illustration, the, the three things that we look at most, most common for a typical three-cylinder engine is the pitch and yaw, which are usually inertial imbalances, as well as the uh, second order uh, roll gas plunger. So those are rolling about the x-axis. You can see there's a number of different rotations and, and modes that we are, we are looking. We treat each one of those separately in order to isolate and make sure that the isolation path with each one of these mold, modes is, is, is taken care of. This would be common for uh, a typical four-cylinder engine. These would start to become a little bit more balanced. So we're looking at the second order vertical, which is inertia. And we'll also be looking at the um, disturbance mode from the, the second order roll. So again, it's a rotation about, uh, about the x-axis. The third most common one is the six cylinder inline engine. Uh, these tend to be a little bit more balanced, but we also we wanted to make sure that um, we're, we're taking into account the, the roll from the gas plunger. So this can the roll. So while the three, four, and six are the most common, we also take a look at any other engine packages. This is just a summary. Um, certainly the, the, the V6, the inline eight, V8, V12, V6, they have their own disturbances in each one of those modes. So we will look at those separately. Uh, these tend to be a little bit less common, but we certainly look at them the same way as we treat the, the three, four, and six. So with the primary disturbances out of the way, we often get questions from our customers about some of the common problems they see, where are some of the issues that they are starting to notice on their systems that haven't been isolated, which prompts a question, is my system optimized correctly? So now we, we're going to post up our, our next poll question. So what is the most common issue you have experienced in selecting your engine mount system? Limited space to fit the current design. Mounts will not fit the existing mounting bracket. Mounts do not perform as expected. Mounts tend to fail prematurely in application. Or I don't have the tools to analyze my system correctly.
some of the most common problems we get from our, our, our customers are um, using the same mount from a previous installation. While it might be convenient in order to speed up the process, often when, what happens when you start changing pumps, uh, transmission to our attached com components, is you start to change the imbalance of how that mount system reacts, and you start to cause sometimes more problems than you're incurring. Another common issue that we, we typically see is the incorrect bracket thickness, or the, the, the edges of that bracket are not chamfered correctly. And what happens is the, the bracket is sharp and it cuts into the mount, causing the mount to prematurely fail. Last one is they're not using the correct type of mount for the application. And this could be as simple as they're not using a mount that's designed for more rugged applications, or they're, they're using a mount that doesn't allow for different motion or isolation in, in different directions. So how do you know if your mount is, is incorrect or is not um, proper for the application? You start to see some, some telltale signs, much like this picture here, where you start to see the mount degrade prematurely. Or in this particular case, you can clearly see that this mount is overloaded. And this is typically what we see when a customer changes um, an engine package or adds some pumps or changes their transmission where the load has shifted over the mounting points and they become overloaded. This is a clear indication that the mount is incorrect for this particular application. So some of the key reasons like we like to do the analysis early in the design process is more or less to help our customers speed up their design and, and avoid costly mistakes. By allowing us to look at or taking a look at the, the, the mount system much, much earlier in the design phase, this gives us much more opportunities to have different options in the system. Quite often our customers come to us after, late in the process where their mounting brackets are already set or the locations are already set. And it leaves us very little um, in terms of tools in order to optimize the mount system. And we're forced to make some trade-offs. Second thing is this allows for better optimization if we can make sure that the mounting locations can be put in the proper space. Again, uh, if the, the mount locations are fixed, um, sometimes, you know, we can optimize the system by moving the mount locations either up or down or front to back. Something to get a little more in line with the, the center of gravity of the crankshaft center line allows for different um, variations. If these positions are fixed, it becomes often much more difficult um, to isolate if there's not that leeway to change. The third thing allows us to uh, optimize the op optimize, uh, isolation profile. And this prevents us from making um, trade-offs where we might not have the best solution, but it will be good enough based on the parameters that we're giving. And again, this is typically to do with space, um, location, position, anything that will influence how we can change that system will have an effect on why it's key to do the analysis early on in the design. Now I'd like to pass this over to Greg Chudlinski to walk through uh, how we perform an analysis and the methodology we do use in order to determine the correct mounting system. Thank you, Mike. And uh, now we'll start talking about the system analysis methodology. So this is the starting point. Uh, the starting point is an engine with the attachments being used in the actual application. Uh, we can analyze uh, multiple different types of engine attachments transmissions, gearboxes, pumps, generators, engine only. Um, you know, it, we can analyze any type of engine mounting system that uh, you have. Um, so the first step is to gather all the data required for the engine analysis. So this sheet can be found online on our website and also in our catalog and can also be provided through email. This will simplify down the engine system to the specific data that we require for analysis. Uh, so the, the specific data that we are uh, looking for is the engine type. So an inline three cylinder, inline four cylinder, six cylinder, V6. Um, that information is given on this data sheet. Uh, we're also looking for the weight of the components the CG location of the components, the mount locations, the idle and operating speeds of the engine, the mass moments of inertia of the components at their CG, and also the maximum output torque of the engine. 
So alternately, if customers already have this data compiled in drawings or layouts, presentations, or any other uh, format, we can use that instead of having the customer fill out the analysis data sheet. Um, if the customer has this information compiled already, it really comes down to what is easier and more convenient for them to provide us with this information. So after we have all the data, next we will build our analysis model. Uh, we use a proprietary uh, internally developed software called Harmony. Harmony is a very powerful program that can analyze uh, single body systems, multi-body systems. Uh, we can also analyze uh, all different types of static and dynamic uh, loads. Uh, and also it can analyze uh, nonlinear mount properties um, in any type of situation where that may be required. Uh, once the Harmony model is uh, created, we will start analyzing uh, several different mount styles, uh, mount spring rates to start to uh, optimize the mount uh, system. Uh, for engines, generally, uh, we complete a uh, static analysis uh, that includes uh, analyzing the engine weight and then the engine torque. Uh, this will ensure that the mounts that we select can handle the application loads. And also next, we will complete a dynamic analysis. And the dy dynamic analysis will include uh, looking at the natural frequencies and also the engine disturbances. Uh, so these are both very uh, critical things to know about the system. The natural frequencies will you know, ensure that we have an understanding of where the system resonances are to make sure no uh, engine modes can be excited. And also the engine disturbances, we will plot the transmissibility curves for each of the primary engine disturbances to make sure that uh, the engine disturbances are in isolation at idle speed and throughout the engine operating range. And also uh, we can analyze any uh, specific application loads like shock inputs or ground inputs or um, you know maneuvering loads that uh, may may occur in specific applications we can also analyze that um, if, if that is required so once we've completed the analysis and selected the mounts that will provide the uh, optimum performance we will take the output from uh, the output results from harmony and populate them into an analysis summary form. This summary form will provide information on the recommended mounts, the loads, um, the system information like the mount locations and the mass summary. Um, it will also provide the natural frequencies and the transmissibility curves um, of the system. So one of the most critical uh, pieces of information in the analysis summary is the transmissibility curve. Low transmissibility values indicate good isolation. So uh, transmissibility values below one are acceptable and the lower the better. Transmissibility values greater than one, they're not desirable, but sometimes they are unavoidable, uh, particularly for uh, low order vibrations that are common in uh, three and four cylinder engines. And then transmissibility values above two are generally uh, not acceptable. So as can be seen in this uh, curve, uh, the idle speed of 800 RPM is marked. So when looking at this transmissibility curve at 800 RPM, you can see the transmissibility value is below one at approximately 0.5. So this would be a, a well isolated system because the transmissibility value is 0.5 at idle. And then the rest of the operating uh, range from 800 RPM on is all well below one. So this would be considered a well isolated engine. Once the summary is completed, they are then sent to the customer for review. And after that, 
uh, we can have, you know, discussions regarding the results. Um, oftentimes, you know, uh, we can have teleconferences or conference calls to discuss the results and our recommendations. And at this time, we're going to launch our third and final poll question. That question is, how do you currently analyze or optimize your engine mounting system? A, in-house design team. B, pick items from a catalog. C, rely on engine manufacturer. Or D, use third party like a vibration isolator expert. So next we will talk about our Parker Lord capabilities and how we can help. So, so far what I've discussed has focused really on uh, engine isolation and our analysis of, of those, but we can analyze and design any part for your vibration and motion control needs. As can be shown on this slide, we have suspension components, cab mounts, driveline couplings, mounts for sensitive electronics. So we, we are able to provide and analyze and design several different types of, of mounts for whatever your needs are. So we did cover uh, the dynamic systems analysis software. So just a, a quick overview again is, you know, this uses stiffness and damping properties at mounting points. We went over Harmony. We actually have another internally, internally developed six degree of freedom uh, analysis software that we can use uh, called Dynasim. This can be used. It, it does not have um, the multi-body and the non-linear spring rate capabilities of Harmony, but this, this is also another tool in our toolbox. And one benefit to using these uh, internally developed programs is that they are not uh, FEA or finite element analysis programs. So this reduces time to by, uh, for building the models and the analysis. And they do assume it's rigid body motion with lumped masses. We also have several different uh, mount specific analysis softwares that we use. They include different checklists, calculators, and analysis programs to help us design and develop new parts for different applications. And then in, in addition to that, we also use uh, industry standard tools like ANSYS, NASTRAN, Autodesk Inventor, and CATIA. We also have a state-of-the-art 14,000 square foot uh, test facility. This test lab also supports uh, the industrial products, aerospace products, and materials development. And the primary purpose of the test lab is to help with risk reduction, uh, qualification testing, and any type of developmental testing that is required on, uh, on our parts. Uh, they have the ability to do static testing, uh, dynamic testing, fatigue testing, environmental and thermal testing, uh, which can be particularly uh, useful and helpful today, especially as engines are getting more powerful and running hotter to make sure that the engine mounts that we are uh, recommending can and designing can accommodate that, that higher heat in these applications and vibratory testing. I want to thank Mike McNeil again for joining us on this webinar today. Mike and the team at RPM have locations in both Ontario and Buffalo, enabling great service for Canada and New York State. In addition to RPM, Parker Lord has four other channel partners that enable us to reach OEMs of all sizes in North America. The map below illustrates the regions these five channel partners cover. And please go to lord.com for more information or to contact Parker Lord directly. So the key takeaways that we've covered so far today are the role isolators play in a fully optimized system. What information is needed to perform an analysis on an engine system. Reduce unexpected performance issues or added costs by doing an analysis early. 
and Parker Lord engineers and channel partners are here to help. And here's the contact information for the panelists today. Um, if you would like to contact us directly, uh, we also have a hotline, one eight seven seven Ask Lord, and you can also visit us on our websites, uh, lord.com/isolators, and also rpmrubberparts.com. And now uh, we would like to open it up to any questions that you may have. 